Like, so basically, this this whole thing is taking place in Matt's apartment in San Francisco. Let's just give you all a tour of how large this uh, room is. Yeah, I'm just gonna spin you around here. For the dedication of what we are, we've spent about three hours in this room. Yeah, and we haven't recorded shit yet. Nope. But ah, uh, oh, Matt, you ruined it. Anyway, um, and it, so this <laughs> is the black so we talked before <laughs> about challenges that we uh, face as a band, and Matt taking his shirt off all the damn time is one of them. And me and uh, myself. Loving him oh. nonetheless. Uh, but yeah, so. So this is this is Studio Three essentially, uh, the San Francisco base, which we don't record at often. In fact, this is the only time we've ever done it. Uh, I used to live in San Francisco for the summer, and we recorded there a bunch. Just that's Matt and I. TAPN Zero. Yeah, that's tapping. That's Ground Zero. Tappin Zero. That's tapping um, Zero. And uh, and it all radiated outward from that location. And a little bit of work done in Sebastopol, and a lot, and especially after the first half of the songs were recorded, uh, we pretty much did everything in uh, Cloverdale. The Dell. Tappan One. The yeah. Dell, yo. So this is, uh, I've mentioned before, uh, this is basically three types of local. Uh, local San Francisco, local Sebastopol, local, San local Cloverdale, all Northern California, because, yep. you know, that's just, I mean, that's where we're from. NorCal. What yeah. can we say about I'm faith? from Massachusetts, motherfucker. If I had to pick like one like biggest influence, it would easily be the Black Keys because I'm always trying to be Dan Auerbach, basically, uh, successfully or not. That's really up to the listener, but um, <laughs> yeah, probably not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of them would be the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Um, Surprise. <laughs> no, <laughs> mostly I think not just one member, but all of them. Um, I mostly play bass, but I like listening to all types of music. There's a band I really like that, uh, not that well known, but not super indie or anything. Uh, they're called the Constantines, or actually just Constantines, uh, like Pixies, Constantines, uh, a band from uh, Guelph, Ontario, Canada. Um, they're super amazing. Uh, I really like their uh, their uh, their singer is very good at playing lead guitar and singing at the same time, which is, is if you know, incredibly difficult. And uh, I don't know. I think he kind of deserves to be one of the greatest guitarists of all time. But it's like about subtlety and how he arranges music. It's, it's, I like the melodies that he uses and stuff like that. So I don't think I consciously try and sound like him, but I've definitely like absorbed uh, that sort of maybe a year for that type of music. Uh, so the other influence I could name probably be Built to Spill. Uh, they are. Um, they're one of my favorite bands in general, and, and I also try to do what they do in terms of making the big, cloudy, foggy kind of kind of guitar sound with just layers and layers and tons of effects, and just kind of go for more, just blasting in the face with noise, and also, you know, a bit of I mean, a bit of the artistry in there too. When the camera's off, like there's a lot of high energy and sanity inside my body. I guess that gets channeled in through the bass, and that's where I relate to Flea. Is if you listen to the Chili Peppers' early stuff, it's really wild and like drugged out and coked out and then that kind of refines as years go on and I was never like coked out or drugged out but much <laughs> my technique may have been <laughs> Keep talking. considering I never really knew what I was doing until I got lessons once I got lessons and started working with a group more or less with you guys <laughs> I think we count <laughs> I think so too I try to draw a little bit on, uh, and this is where I decide that, hey, I've decided to be a hipster today, but I try to draw on the Velvet Underground some, too. Oh! Uh, yeah, because, uh... My influences aren't that great. I mean, it's mostly just the Chili Peppers. That's what I started kind of learning with my lessons. And then once I learned theory, just like Matt was saying, I, I kind of started just playing my own stuff. There's no real point in learning everyone else's songs. Um, maybe some of the old-timey, like, jazz stuff, like Summertime. That kind of stuff is really important. Uh, it gives you like a basics, <laughs> basic like progression, I guess, to to kind of work with that everyone in the room might know when you're just jamming. But with these guys, it's different. We we kind of don't do that. We just play what we do, kind of fall into place, and eventually we're like, oh, that's really cool. So I guess my major influences would be the Chili Peppers, um, a tiny bit of Radiohead, and then these guys here. To be honest. One thing I really appreciate about music, and I've always always appreciated about music, is how infinite it is. And it's really infinite. There's there's no limits from anything, from 
the mathematical patterns to music, to different tunings, to different scales, to what effects you run your instrument through, to what orchestration or order you put the parts in. It's, it's really infinite. It kind of boils down to simplicity. Like it is, I like the way their, so their sound is really stripped down, and sometimes I like to veer in that direction instead. Uh, so I try to kind of hit a balance between all three of those things. And more generally, um, you know, I'm kind of born to rock kind of guy. I've always liked rock and roll of all types. You know, my punk phase in high school and um, Black Keys pretty much since then and a lot of indie rock besides. And I spent a lot of, you know, I spent pretty much the entire 90s listening to alternative radio. So there's, there's a lot of that thrown in too, you know, kind of everywhere from like Nirvana to Space Hog to Oasis. More on that later. I started playing when I was uh, 14 or 15. I, uh, my friend's brother is a really good musician, and he uh, he had a guitar. I thought it was kind of cool, and he, he showed me how to play some songs. Um, yeah, you, you guys both know the song that I'm thinking of, but I don't say it's really funny. Um, is it The Cow Says Moo? No. Okay. <laughs> no. Um, First Take Rosa, check that out if you want to see it. Yeah. Editing uh, Audio porn in the building, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if you want to include it, the song was uh, Last Resort by Pop Roach. Probably a bad decision. And my dad later got me the How to Play Infest uh, book for Hanukkah. <laughs> so I started learning some other Pop Roach songs. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have the book here. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's not true. Uh, that, no, that's, I, that's not a lie. That's completely true. And, uh, well, uh, I started playing, I guess, guitar when I um, I had a dream one night that I was like, I'm trying to remember the details, it's kind of wild. Uh, I played a lot on Nintendo 64 back in the day, so I had a dream, I was in Super Mario Land and I was playing guitar. It was really, really cool, and that sounds wild, but it was really cool. And this kid I went to school with named CJ, who had really wild hair, was like hipping the whole time I was playing. And it was a lot of fun, playing music for someone. And as soon as I woke up that day, I was like, I want a guitar. So I went through my room and I put up a bunch of stuff I had on eBay to get enough money to buy a, uh, a Kramer, which is like an Epiphone knockoff, which is a knockoff of Gibson, so it's like a knockoff of a knockoff. And I started trying to play that. I learned to play like the Star Spangled Banner and like James Bond theme, stuff like that. When did you start playing? Um, I first, my dad gave me my first guitar um, when, I was, uh, when I was about 10. And uh, it was his old one from uh, from when he was a little kid. So, um, you know, I, I picked a few chords. He taught me A minor, D minor, and E major, and I just fooled around with those for about three years nonstop until I finally learned power chords. I started trying to actually like think about how to utilize some of the stuff that I learned in my lessons. Scales, um, modes, like Matt was talking about, um, how it all plays together. Even when said other people may not be using certain modes, I can find a way to, to stay relatively in key or figure out what notes are being played the most out of them. So oh, after, after I learned all the, basically, cowboy chords and power chords most of the way through high school and not really advancing all that much until very much later, but, you know, tried to in college a little bit and learned really slowly. Mm -hmm. I all sort of developed as soon as I was about 23. But flash forward a few years later, I got into high school and I started playing around with the kids there in multiple areas, like singing and just all sorts of uh, shenanigans. And there was this bass that everyone lovingly coined shit bass. It had three strings, um, it's pretty shitty looking. I started taking that home, and my mom felt pity on me, I guess, at one point when I kept trying to learn to play on this piece of crap. And she took me out to buy a bass, and Shortly after that, we got lessons, because why spend money on a bass if you're not going to you know, have someone teach you? So I started getting lessons with Gio Benedetti of a um, Toast Machine. Um, he, had, he was giving lessons at Zone, and it was nearby, so that was more or less why I chose him, not for what he was, who he was. There we go. We, we met for the first time on a long walk on a sunny beach. Uh, it, was, it was autumn, and uh, no... <coughs> Actually, no, the serious answer is we were just like, we just sort of met through some friends outside the music room one day in high school and didn't really interact much until, well, after that. It was, a, you know, my first summer back from college and, and you and I were at the same party and we just kind of hung out and then we started hanging out a lot more after that point because we sort of 
had a, had a really good like friendship connection going on, and then it kind of just turned into stuff from there. And sooner or later, we just started jamming together, and you know, back in my power chord phase, and that was a lot of fun, but sounded probably terrible to everyone within uh, within hearing distance. <laughs> But we had a really good time. We all kind of knew each other in school, more or less. Miguel and I were in choir, so we, we had a good relationship kind of musically through that. Um, I was always a tenor, and he was like either a bass or a tenor. So we were either working together or in harmony. So that really kind of helped out. Matt I met through a, a British friend of ours named Tom Coyston. Yeah, he's just Tom Coyston, let's just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> But we all met. I hope he watches this video. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and we all hung out and... Tom, you truly are infamous. Yeah, he's the infamous Tom Coyston. Everyone knows who yeah, TCB is. Um, so yes, we all kind of started hanging out and that's how I met Matt. And another friend of ours, Jordan, kind of entered the picture because he played trumpet. Me, Matt, and Jordan had like a one-day band in Matt's bedroom once. Um, I knew Jeff in high school. We hung out. We used to play music together, but nothing really came up anything. No, yeah. We both didn't really have training. Yeah. And um, so we did that. And uh, then Miguel, I think I knew, like, we had friends. Or I just heard about him, but me and Miguel didn't really start hanging out until college. And we just found out that we had, like, all this stuff in common. Like, we listened to a lot of the same music. Um, we had very similar, albeit very different senses of humor. And then we kind of, like, all branched out and left high school and did our own thing for a while. And, uh, until that one day, like, it was Miguel's birthday, I believe, and we came over to celebrate, and they were playing music, and I wanted a part of it. And I expressed that by telling them what I thought about their music. They liked my, I guess, direction or intent, so they offered me a job. <laughs> yeah, Jeffrey and I were in choir together in high school, which was, uh, a lot of how we just start, started doing music together, at least in that phase of our lives, we were developing a really good musical sense, kind of in, a, in tandem. Um, and like Jeff said, you know, being, in, being in either the same part or near the same part kind of helped us. We were always together on the risers, so we're, you know, buddied up and goofing off and, you know, probably making our teachers life hell a little bit. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, or a lot. Um, shouting obscenities and all that, you know, good times. Genital had names. By, good times had by all except our teacher. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, just like, I remember, I remember, in, like, kind of, uh, it was like probably my most vivid memory of Jeff in high school was us hanging out in the uh, line by the student store and talking about how fucking awesome we thought at the drive-in was. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that I think was a really good, just like, all right, this guy's all right. <laughs> one arm yeah. scissor, man. <laughs> yeah. We were just like, Napoleon Solo is so yeah. freaking awesome. Yeah. Right? High five. You know, like, yeah, having that little <laughs> moment of Jeff looking all scruffy and me looking equally, if not more scruffy, and that's at some point kind of reconnected after high school and just been like, man, why haven't we been hanging out this whole time? Let's, you play bass? Awesome. Let's do this. And then Jeff, like, Jeff's just been my homie for a while. Um, you know, kind of on and off. Yeah, and then... Uh, <laughs> Sporadic. <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah, and then me and Jeff, uh, yeah, me and Jeff hung out a lot in high school, and then I, like, didn't see him for, like, seven years. And then I know, yeah. We were, like, friends on Facebook, and he knew Miguel, and me and Miguel were, had, like, a two-person project, and, and Jeff came over to to Miguel's birthday and heard me and Miguel play and like some of the songs and they're like, oh, he just plays bass and he's like a really cool guy. And then I asked him if he wanted to play bass for us and he said, like, yes. And it was when we had all three of us together and like finding a complete thing. Kind of made the whole, uh, whole thing come together. There's a process. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the in the sense that it can even be called a process, it more just it's more just kind of catching those really good moments of impro improvisation as we go. So I think my songwriting process is like totally half-assing it. It's like one third half-assing stuff. So it's sixth ass it, assing it. Um, yes, and then um, one third like. Um, intellectual, even scientific curiosity about, like, the limits of music, and then one-third, like, fun slash maybe diligence. Usually these guys will have something put together. That's more or less like with First Take Rosa, because that's how we met. For adjective plural noun, more or less, Miguel's had something put together for me most of the time. With Faraha, Matt kind of, Matt and Miguel had something going first, and I kind of came on into that. But with adjective plural noun, I basically just listen to what Miguel's playing, 
and music starts playing in my head. Um, from what I've learned with modes and scales, I've learned how to take what's in my head and make it happen here and make, make music happen. And then finally, um, playing with adjective plural noun, um, because we're doing something for a video game and ultimately because it's very much uh, Miguel's brainchild and then Jeff probably still him being around more uh, is it's is really uh, Miguel and, and also Jeff's project more than mine. So which is which is good, um, because I'm very full of myself and it's probably good if I'd be given less control. Uh, <laughs> 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 to be completely honest. Um Taxi Cab confession. So it's definitely uh, <laughs> If it's something that I would personally dance to, if someone else is playing, I'll I'll keep going, and I'll just try to feel it as much as I can. Because the bass, it's all about you don't want to overcomplicate things. As far as the uh, pr production goes, you know, we take we take this long loop for the same thing, and we just kind of look for that little diamond in the rough, cut it out, repeat it as many times as possible, get get all the good takes together, and usually you know can kind of meditate on that for about six hours, just look up and suddenly, oh shit, it's dark, I've been doing this all day, and, you know, kind of, it's a, it's a lot like that, a lot of the, the kind of solitary sit at the desk staring and listening to the same loop over and over again for hours, uh, kind of process. Um, a different question, what's on the list, um, when you do production, what do you choose to listen to, headphones or speakers? I mostly stick with speakers because I feel like that my, my headphones kind of give me way too much bass. So I end up trying to cut out the really droney bass and all the bottom end, all the all that yeah. bothersome bottom end. But then I'll listen to it on on speakers or on different headphones and just everything else, and it's like, where's the bass? It just kind of disappears if you use the headphones. So I try to. I mean, lately I've been trying to mix it up as often as possible. Like you know, I'll maybe go an hour on headphones and an hour on uh, on uh, speakers, and just just try to switch it up as often as possible so I don't get too stuck on any one thing kind of get a little truer sense of what it's actually sounding like. So really writing complete songs. Um, pretty much got my start here with like a few exceptions. Maybe writing complete songs that weren't very basic, like four or five chord songs. Well this project in particular I think is where I first started getting really comfortable doing leads. I think, you know, I've been building up to it while we were working together as first Take Rosa. You know, taking on a lot more lead parts or at least taking in charge of a lot more projects. But this way, uh, I've kind of forced myself to really look at scales, like note by note at least. You know, not, not so much in the understanding of how scales work because I always use a cheat sheet, but more in the sense of I'm going to look up this scale, I'm going to get a map in my head because I'm really visual like that of just what notes I can play, or at least on this zone of the fretboard, all the places I can go. And I'd, you know, just kind of tap out things until they sounded good and started getting a better feel for, for the instrument and starting to get a better feel for what I could do with it. And I'm just starting to build slowly on the little knowledge that I had. And it turned out, you know, I've actually gotten a few solos done, which I was pretty sure was impossible right around when I was 18. It's gotten more focus. Um, it's gotten more uh, deliberate. Um, I'm trying less not to like just sit there and just doodle, but to think about where I'm starting, how I'm starting, and where I am in relation to what's going on. And well, it's what you'd expect. The there's like um, you know, if you come in with a song or a riff or something, and you want it to go a certain way, um, and then people have other other ways that they want to do it, and that's good too. Um, but maybe you already had in your head to like you had all these expectations of it, and now it's something else. Sometimes you have to be the babysitter, and sometimes you have to be babysat. You know, I think everybody, especially you know, we had a, we hit a really rough patch when we were doing first take Rosa stuff, where everybody was just like getting really hard on everybody else. Like, and, right before our and, first show. Yeah, right before our first and so far only show, and uh, <laughs> and and you know, just getting all sorts of creative, just jams in the works, everybody wanting to play everybody else's part for them, kind of going, like, you have a band of three Billy Corgans, essentially, and somebody's bound to get pissed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we got a, you know, we got a lot more comfortable with each other after that point. Just the process of maintaining a friendship while trying to maintain a professional relationship, which I think anyone can relate to that's been in that. To those that can't, imagine trying to wash your cat while still being friends with it afterwards. You know, it can be difficult. It's just like a friendship thing, too. We're really friends. So, it's um, definitely just like you spend a lot of time with people. 
and just like little things are kind of just like we'll get we'll like great on each other sometimes I guess but but at the same time you gotta make light of the situation or else it's just a bunch of egotistical assholes shitting all over each other in a really small, small room. We just, we don't have to do the whole, like, you know, my song thing that we were doing <laughs> before. We just kind of, we just kind of go for it, and here's a direction, and everybody has some input, and somebody is there making a final decision about how this is actually going to turn out, and I think, and I think that's worked really well, because again, like, you know, hey, I'm not in this band with you guys because I just need someone to make me look good. You know, I'm in this band with you guys because you guys are good musicians and I like hearing your ideas and combining them with my own. So, you know, keeping keeping that intact while still maintaining a certain focus, I think, has really helped us along in kind of defining defining us as a, as a group. So I, my musical style is, is really based on these, like, shitty, terrible origins that no one likes to talk about. So I really, uh, I learned Papa Roach and Incubus and Blink-182 songs. Um, KZST? No, I don't know. I like to analyze <laughs> pop music. I like to find out why it sells. You'd be surprised once you turn off the uh, factor of the music. You'd be surprised at what lessons something that you really hate can teach you. That's why I've always managed to have a very broad opinion on what I'm listening to. And very, be very open. I have a really good friend. He says it's not what you like, it's why you like it. So I actually don't really mind. That I, I don't have this very broad taste in music. So, uh, influence I really like. I really like Joan Osborne. You know, what if God was one of us? I alluded to this before, but Oasis. Um, yeah, people always, you know, I have this backpack with an Oasis patch, and everybody always goes, like, you know, when they see it, they're like, oh, Miguel, you listen to Oasis? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, why? Uh, mayonnaise. Yeah. <laughs>